Hello everybody, this is Anthony for Investors Underground. Today, I have an opportunity to speak with the one and only Scott Manzo. Scott worked as a stockbroker for eight years before he tried day trading. He's now been a successful full-time trader for over 20 years. He uses a mean reversion strategy on an intraday time basis. Today, we'll discuss his trading system, personal journey into trading, metaphors, and more. You can follow him on Twitter at Scott Manzo. Hello, Scott. Thank you for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Anthony. I got a chance to meet you out at Traders for a Cause in Vegas. Uh, I've watched probably all your videos. What I would say to the, the viewers today who are trying to become better at trading, that's why you're watching this video, to get a pen and a piece of paper and uh, write down a couple of things that I have to say today that maybe you can implement in your strategy. Um, that makes a big difference, uh, writing things down. Um, I do it. I take notes on all the videos that I watch and compile them together. And, uh, and it, it helps me greatly. So it's a, it's a habit of mine and you want to, you want to learn how to be successful. This is one of the things, um, that I do, uh, just one of the things I, before we get started is, um, I have a saying, uh, about the stock market and I, I just wanted to throw it out there. The stock market is really hard. Trading is really hard. When something's really hard, not a lot of people can do it. And when not a lot of people can do it, the financial reward can be great. So let's not hope that the game is easier. Let's get better at the game. And that's what this is all about. Thank you so much, Scott. And it was a pleasure to get to meet you at Traders for a Cause. Your speech was excellent. And from my perspective, it was a fan favorite. Everybody that I spoke to loved it. You dropped a lot of knowledge. And I hope we can continue to do that today. And yes, grab a piece of paper and a pencil, whatever you use to take notes. And Scott always brings great information. So thank you for being here, Scott. Um, I would... Love to start by just asking a little bit about your background and your upbringing. How did that impact your decision to trade and has it had an influence on how you trade? Very much so. Um, you know, going back to the beginning, I was uh, I was born in Boston, Massachusetts and uh, lived up there, completed the ninth grade of high school and moved to South Florida. Um, I was uh, grew up in a let's call it a blue collar family, didn't have uh, a lot of money. Um, there was a lot of things that I saw in life that uh, I wanted, that I was willing to work for. Um, the type of guy that's ready to roll up his sleeves and get dirty and and dig in uh, for the things that I want um, in life. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a competitive guy. Uh, I don't like losing. And ironically, um, being great at trading, you need to be an expert loser. So that was uh, that was that was an interesting lesson to learn when I first started out um, in the business. And uh, so I I moved to Florida. I went to school at University of Florida. Um, I was always a very social guy. Uh, I was I was president of my senior class in high school. I was president of my fraternity at the University of Florida. Uh, which took a little bit away from my studies. So I was a finance major and uh, I'm probably good at finance because I had to take the class twice. The first time I took it, I got a D. I had, a, I had to take it over again. Um, so that was, uh, that was pretty humbling and it's, it's uh, good to be humbled in life and, and stay humble. Um, after I graduated college, needed to make some money, started selling copiers out of the back of my car uh no air conditioning driving around in sunny south florida um did that for six months learned some great lessons went to work for a finance company making high interest rate loans uh kind of taking advantage of uh lower income people and it just felt awful going to work every day uh my brother-in-law was a stockbroker and i had a finance degree and he was doing well and He's like, get a, get a suit and a pen. That's all you need. Go get an interview. And I uh, got a job and I worked at a couple of different brokerage firms for, for a while. And the uh, brokerage industry kind of went from transactional to asset gathering about 20, 25 years ago. 
and um, I just uh, didn't didn't love that. And uh, I wanted to be more transactional and kind of got into trading for myself when I was a broker. Um, saved up some money and said to the to the wife, "Honey, I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go day trade for a living. If I lose, uh, I started an account with a hundred thousand dollars. I said if I lose fifty, I will uh, fifty thousand. I'll I'll cut it out um, and I'll go back to being a stockbroker. But I want to. I really want to give this a shot and see if I can do it because I had a number of friends that were traders. Um, most didn't make it. Some you know, a couple did." Um, and that's uh, kind of how I um, got started out in life. Did your experience as a stockbroker mold your perception of the market at all? It's a great advantage to go from being a stockbroker to go into day trading. And, and there's been probably a, a, a number of people that I've come across on on Twitter that have uh, or YouTube videos that have had that that same transition to get burned out being a broker you don't like it and you're like well i i know the markets a little bit um to make a baseball analogy when you start out trading you're at home plate you're hoping to hit a single get on first base and second base third base and and make it home and put some points on the scoreboard uh when you're a stockbroker and you've been doing it for a while the all of the knowledge that you you need to get started out you already you already have you've been staring at the screen so like i was when i got into trading i would consider myself starting on second base as 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 opposed to um starting it at home plate and one of the interesting things uh, about the being a stockbroker was you had like good fundamental knowledge of like companies because you'd have to learn about a company to pitch it to a client and so forth um so I, I learned a lot about uh like fundamentals you had to take a series seven um and i had a seven and eight a 63 65 life health variable annuity all that stuff i had like all the licenses so i studied a, a lot of stuff so that was a good foundation you understand how interest rates affect stocks and things like that things that for the last 10 15 years you didn't really have to worry too much about but now you can see um with what the fed's doing how kind of that really uh, impacts the market um so from a fundamental basis being a stockbroker was uh, uh a huge a huge head start that it, it cut the learning curve in trading uh quite a bit that's really interesting yeah definitely in 2023 and even in 2022 as you mentioned, you know, the Fed and, and interest rates and things like that have definitely come into the market. I've seen a lot of traders mention CPI reports or um, what the, the head of the Federal Reserve is going to be saying or how they interpret how they interpret what he's saying. Yeah, small cap short sellers are talking about non-farm payroll reports and CPI reports. And, you know, at 8.30 uh, in the morning um, on the Friday or the Wednesday or whatever it is, you you know, you better be uh, flat um, or you're, you know, going to be rolling the dice or you, be, or you better be hedged or, you know, whatever it is. So, the, but the market is a, is an ever-changing animal and you got to adapt, adapt, adapt and stay up to speed with, you know, what's important and what's not. Um, and you need to be aware of that. And I'm sure we'll talk about that later. Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that I've heard you mention, Scott, is that the two holy grails um, for trading are consistency and risk management. I would love to talk a little bit about um, both of those and how they interact with one another, if that's okay. Sure. And and you probably picked that up from the Traders for a Cause speech. Um, but uh, I'd like to probably expand upon it a, a little bit and add a couple of things that uh, are very important when it comes to consistency and my my traders for a cause speech was was on consistency because that's what i'm really good at my uh, every year since i've been in the business i've been able to make money um i don't uh lose all that often um on a on a monthly basis um i certainly have losing days but you know i have very 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 high win rates and we'll get into how i you know, get it, those high win rates. But when we talk about consistency, there's there's three things to me 
that are really, really, really important, like one plus one plus one equals five. If you can do the first three things, it's going to translate into consistency. And consistency is important because if you're going to sit in this chair for 20 plus years and make a living out of it, uh, you don't want to have a, a ton of stress and consistency reduces stress. Um, that's a that's a big one in, in your life routine and also even more so in trading. Um, so the, the first thing that I want to talk about, and this is definitely more applicable to newer traders, is you have to be a specialist in trading. You have to get really good at one thing. And in order to get really good at one thing, you have to develop a trading system. Um, trading system plus execution plus risk management equals consistency. That's like the, the formula to me, that's like the most important thing. So when we talk about a trading system, like that word or phrase has become more popular over the last five or 10 years. No one really talked about it prior to that, but um, as you, as traders got better and better, they realized they needed to specialize. So like, what is a, a, a trading system? So let's talk about like a, a couple of examples because new traders need to have a trading system that gives you an edge, a higher percentage chance of winning against the market. Uh, a 60% chance, a 70% chance, an 80% chance, what, whatever it is, you, you need an edge. Um, it's hard to go 50-50 uh, in the market unless your winners are a lot bigger you know, than your losers, but you probably can develop a system where your, where your edge increases uh, your odds of a successful outcome. So um, let's start with like a, a simple one. Uh, Bill O'Neill, who's the founder of Investors Business Daily. If you are a, a guy who likes to be bullish on the stock market, buy breakouts, buy high growth companies, buy stocks that are trending well. You can buy the book, you know, How to Make Money in the Stock Market by Bill O'Neill. And he's got a, a trading system in there. And in the trading system, it talks about, okay, the max drawdown that I can have on a trade is 8%. So something very simple just to translate it for the viewers is I have a $100,000 account. Um, the biggest investment I'm going to make is $10,000 or 10% of my account. So I'm going to invest $10,000 or you know in this stock trade. And the worst case scenario is 8%. I already if I bought it properly, um, I'm going to get stopped out when I lose 8%, whether I'm long or I'm or I'm short. Um, but Bill's system will be okay. Stock is basing, 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 breaks out, you know, pulls back, breaks out further. And I'm going to win three times as big as I lose and take profits along the way. So that's an example of, of one trading system. Um, another trading system that I would like to share. So there's a guy I follow on uh, Twitter. His name is SDP. I uh, don't know him, never spoke to him. Um, from the things that he's written, he's a very good trader, but he also posts some very good memes and so if you are a small cap short seller, let's say, and and I'm an investor's underground and it's filled with small cap short sellers and a lot of the most successful traders I know are small cap short sellers. Um, and this works for small caps and it kind of works um, in large caps too. And if you flip this upside down, um, you kind of have a long strategy. It's just in reverse. But I just want to give you another example of what a trading system is. So, you know, you have a stock that's that's running higher, running higher, running higher, running higher, and then it puts in a top and then it takes out uh, a previous low here, um, undercuts this low, and now it's starting to dive down and now it's bouncing back up. And you say, okay, this is the area that I want to make a short sale and I'm going to use a stop a little bit under the high of the day or a stop above the high of the day. Um, algorithms have recently figured out everyone stops at the high, so they take out all the stops and then they 
rip it back lower. So if you're going to have a system with a set of rules, you have to understand that, you know, uh, part of the time you're going to get wicked out and it's going to suck, but you're never going to get bludgeoned um, when you take your stops. So this is an example of another trading system. I'm going to short sale here. I'm going to add to my short sale when it starts working. I'm going to make some covers. I'm going to short a little bit more. And towards the end of the day, I'm, I'm going to cover. So that's another example of a trading system. Scott, can you tell us a little bit about your trading system? My trading system is I'm trading the most volatile um, stocks in the market. I only trade intraday. I don't take overnight positions. So how do I find um, what I'm going to be trading? The most important tool that any trader can really have is a scanner. I use trade ideas. Um, years ago, I used to use uh, something called Whisper. It got bought out. It's not around anymore. Um, so there's trade ideas or scans and so forth. Um, to find uh, the stocks that I want to trade, uh, a very simple box. Um, it's the five minute high and low box. These are stocks that are up or down 5% or more on the day. These are stocks that are most likely going to have the biggest range on the day. So like if I'm throwing a party at my house, these are all the people that I want to invite. That's the, these are these are my type of people. After that five minute box, that shows me what I should be looking at for the day. After that, there's a, another scanner that I have that shows, well, gee, I'm graduating from the five minute box into the crazy activity box. These are the, the people at your house that are taking tequila shots and jumping in the pool. And you're like, this, this is who I want to party with, right? Um, so these are the crazy stocks. So whatever it's up, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200% on the day or down 50% on the day. You have to know the reason why they're up and, you know, fundamentally does it, you know, does it make sense for the moment to help you form an opinion if you want to trade it? And that comes through uh, years of experience. But you need to have a scanner to to show you where the volatility is because you want to, I want to play on the most extreme on the upside and the most extreme on the downside and let it all kind of have the emotion get sucked out of it and kind of meet in the middle. And that's where I'm going to be taking um, some profits. So my trading system, unlike the previous one that I showed you, where you have a defined stop, I'm a front side short seller and a front side uh, dip buyer, which is very dangerous. Um, why is it dangerous? Because where the hell do you stop out if you're wrong? If something is going up and it keeps going up and it keeps going up, the trade is actually becoming better and better from a divergence standpoint. And if it's diving lower and lower and lower, it's the divergence is getting bigger and bigger. And and I'll I'll talk about this uh, a little bit more in a second. So where do you, you know where do you stop out? You know, so my trading system is like okay, I'm shorting a little bit on the front side once it goes parabolic by my definition and then i'm looking to maybe add um a little bit higher if i'm wrong or a little bit lower um if i'm right and vice versa on the long so i'm looking you know to maybe make uh, two entries or three entries um on the stock so getting back to my trading system um the first question I look at uh, when these things are in my scanner is the stock above or below the 20 day moving average, the so 20 period moving average. If it's below the 20 period moving average, I'm probably not going to short it because that's a sign that it's a little oversold and it needs some mean reversion. So I look at the 20 period moving average. The second thing I look at is, is the stock pen penetrating the one minute upper Bollinger Band? Next thing I look at is the stock penetrating the five minute upper Bollinger Band. The next thing I look at is what is the divergence back to the various moving averages? Let's call it the 20 period moving average on the one minute, the 20 period moving average on the five minute, the 200 period moving average on the one minute and the five minute. And basically that's telling me, is there enough meat on the bone to get involved in this risky situation? Is the reward big enough for the risk? 
you know, some guys come in and they trade every day. There's a dollar stock. It's up to a dollar fifty. They're going to trade that stock all day and try to grab 20 cents out of it. And to me, I'm just not going to waste my time on that. I'm going to wait for the bigger fish to fry, the better. Uh, I, I want to be efficient and not have a lot of stress. And that money making opportunity, I don't need to make a couple of hundred bucks. I want to make, you know, thousands, tens of thousands. That's, you know, that that's what I'm interested in. And then the last thing I look at with my trading system is if I have the penetration on the one minute, the five minute, I have the big divergence in there. I look at the RSI on the five minute. And that's the one thing I'm not going to be 100% transparent about. Um, if you're shorting something on the upside, you probably don't want to be short if that RSI on the five minute is under 70. Once you start to get into the 70s, um, it gets interesting. Uh, very few things are able to get like up to like 90 RSI. Um, things like that are highly, 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 uh, probably very low float stocks or something that's just going super parabolic. But you usually don't see that too much. The the number that I like to use is, you know, somewhere um, in the middle. So if all of those criteria are met, um, I'm getting involved in the trade. And that's like my trading system. I have like three things that I trade, but that's my main trading system. So going back to trading systems, IBD is one. Small cap short selling is one uh, on a backside. And then the example that I just gave would be sh shorting on the front side. I, I, I typically trade a lot more large cap than I do small cap. When small cap really starts to heat up, I get involved in it because then the reward becomes really big. I'm not interested in that dollar to dollar fifty move, but if a two dollar stock goes to twelve, you're going to find me there. How did you come across your trading system? I would imagine you didn't just wake up one day and say, "I'm going to become a mean reversion trader. I'm going to implement Bollinger Bands and RSI." How many years did it take you to come across your trading system and to build that and to really hone it? Uh, to the point where you can find consistency in the markets with it? So great, great question. And I uh, hopefully the answer doesn't disappoint, but you know, some of it was just dumb luck. Um, when I left being a stockbroker, I went into an office, a day trading office that had like 20 guys in there or 15 guys in there. And they had this scanner. Um, and, the, and the scanner had these five minute high and low boxes. And the, and the crazy box. And they said, look, this is what we do in this office. These are the scanners. These are the stocks we want to trade. And I was probably just, there were maybe two or three guys that made it out of like 30 guys. So we're all looking at the same information, but there's 500 things that pop up in this box, you know, during the day, or let's, let's call it a hundred things or 50 things. I'm trading one, two or three. Um, I'm trading different ones than what somebody else is trading. Um, so we all have the same information. It's just a matter of, you know, how we execute and what our judgment is. But I just walked into this office and these were the tools that they were using. So it, to me, it was like watching a video game. Um, and I played like, depending on how old your viewers are, uh, I played Asteroids, Missile Command, Defender, Miss Pac-Man. All that stuff is patterns, 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 patterns. You know, if you go this way on Ms. Pac-Man, the, the things that can eat you go the other way. Asteroids, you know how to kill the little ship. And Missile Command, you know how to, uh, where they're coming for. Galaga, these are all like patterns. And to me, it was the same thing in the, uh, in the stock market. And you just had to figure it out. Um, so the tools that like, uh, that I used, so we had the scanners and then, they used e-signal charting platform. Um, I still use it today. Probably nobody new in the business uses it, um, but it's it's been around forever. Uh, they raise the price every year. Uh, like talk about consistency. You never get a break with those people. And the charts uh, for this formula that they were trying to trade in there, that they were trying to like teach me, had Bollinger Bands on it. And then I started watching how stocks react to. Bollinger Bands, Upper Bollinger Bands, Lower Bollinger Bands, 
on a five minute, a one minute, a daily, a weekly, a monthly. I mean, they work. They put the probabilities in your favor that, okay, this is a good place to trim. This is a good place to add. Uh, if I'm buying, you know, weakness or shorting strength, um, the probabilities of you taking something off or adding at a Bollinger Band um, are just as good as a moving average, but they're they're probably even better because they're um, intraday. So it was like walking into a place and this was the toolbox that they gave me. And I just took that toolbox and um, did the best that I could with it. So it wasn't like I read a book that said, uh, you know, try this, 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 and this. It was just like, here's the paint, paint. That's really interesting. And has your trading system and the way that you've traded it, has that changed and evolved over time? For example, were you always an intraday uh, trader or were there times previously, you know, years ago when you were maybe swinging trades more or has it always been just whatever you make that day is what you make? No, I, I uh, traded pre-market. And and I'll trade pre market once or twice or three times a month if if the setup is 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 there um, I'll trade it uh, but I don't actively trade pre market I'm I'm prepping for the day doing my homework um, getting familiar with the market my after hours trading my strategy I I tried it in after hours a couple of times um, I lost so much money uh, mean reversion is not a good strategy in after hours because after hours mainly stocks are reacting to earning earnings reports or fda news or aftermarket news and the market needs time to disseminate that information so if you're going if you're a mean reversion trader and you're taking the other side of the trade um if there's stock specific news that's making it shoot up that strategy um is how you get your face ripped off and you get run over so after i lost a lot of money um trading aftermarket i said well I'm not good at this. Uh, you need to stop doing what you're losing money at. That's very important, no matter how you trade. Uh, so I cut it out. And one of the beauties of that was um, I got to have a life after four o'clock instead of sitting here till six o'clock or seven o'clock. Um, and, and that was just a rule that I made uh, for myself. Don't do what you suck at. You know, they say, you know, winners never quit. People quit all the time. Winners, especially, know what you're good at and and stick to that. If you suck at something, unless the reward of becoming really, really, really good at that is so great, then just cut it out. You don't you don't need it. You you don't. Um, so yeah, I I lost a lot of money after market, and I wasn't good pre market. Uh, so I just kind of you know stuck with intraday trading. And I work in an office. I'm I'm at my office now. It's great we're doing this on a Saturday because I'm not so burnt out from uh, an exhaust exhaustive trading day. At home, I don't even have my trading software loaded on a computer. So I I wake up, I get to my office, I'll get in, you know, if the market's normal, I'll get in at seven, six thirty. The market's really hot. And I need to be there at five o'clock. If there's a big opportunity to make money, I will. Uh, I got in this week twice at four o'clock because there was just some really funky things happening, um, and it paid off. I, I made some uh, it made some good money. But on a regular basis, I don't want to live like that. Um, but when there's opportunity to make, you know, when it's raining money, you got to bring your buckets. And when things are slow, you need to chill out and not force it. Scott, the examples that you gave about the trading system are excellent. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the role and importance of execution and risk management. Um, sure. Two important pieces of the of the three piece puzzle that leads to consistency. So, like execution is like I I think really underrated. Um, you have ideas and you have execution. Everyone has ideas like, oh, this stock is going to be a short and this stock is going to be a long and and I like this longer term. But how many people have the stick to 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 stay with something, keep their eyes on it? Um, Nate sets a lot of price alerts um, that are in investors underground uh, to alert him when something hits a price that it, it needs uh, it needs his attention. Um and I think that's a great way to do it. But 
Like an execution, you have to have a plan. Like, okay, so I have, we talked about trading systems. Okay, so now let's say um, in terms of execution, you know, what what is the plan? You have to have the plan beforehand. So let's say I want to be short 15,000 shares of Bed Bath & Beyond. I'm going to do 5,000 shares um, on the front side. When the lower high comes in, I'm going to do 5,000 more and then 5,000 more on the back side. At what prices those are going to take place, you have to be ready to execute. You can't sit at your desk like all traders do and say, oh, I missed that. Or, oh, I I was looking at something else. I got distracted. Um, that's a lack of focus. That's a lack of having a plan. If you don't have your execution planned out, where you're adding and where you're taking profits at, you're not going to be able to look at your level two screen and watch your P&L go up and down and make the appropriate decisions. The places where you're going to execute need to be predetermined. Um, the first one can be reactionary, but the other ones, you know, you should have an idea of what your plan is um, and executing, adding to your position and taking it off. Like execution, uh, if you're going to take a bus ride to California and you miss the bus, you don't, you know, ex execution is is unbelievably important and people don't like stay focused enough on their target. Like if I have two or three targets and then I miss something great over here because I was focusing on two and three targets, that's fine. In the long run, I'm better focusing on my two or three targets than I am looking over here, looking over here and, you know, seeing what's going on. So execution is is really, really, really important. And I think it's underrated. Um, the next part about it is risk management. And, you know, this isn't my strong suit by by any means. I, I have no business giving a lecture on, on risk management. Um, knowing where to put your stop, um, you know, based on a percentage of uh, what's the max loss on a trade, what's the max loss for a day, what's the max loss on the account, setting a stop at the high, below the high, or on the low. These are all things that, like, you you need to implement a large portion of them, if not all of them. But another thing that another thing that uh, is is a very interesting topic to me in risk management is something called the gambler's ruin, and it's uh, it deals with statistics and probabilities, and it's it's kind of related to uh, the casino, and the the casino is developed on a thesis that we are going to let you play games where the odds are in our favor and you are going to beat us on some hands and some times and walk away a winner. But just based on statistics, we have the edge and our bankroll is bigger than your bankroll. Um, the gambler's ruin comes into play when you lose all your money because you bet poorly and you're out of the game. You really don't want to have that hope happen in the stock market. It's very hard to rebuild an account, refund, and 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 so forth. So the the gambler's ruin talks about the the likelihood of your edge winning a certain round. Um, I, I actually, if you go to my Twitter feed, um, I don't really tweet, but I recently tweeted. I think it was the 10K diver who I follow. He did a 25 or 30 thread tweet on the gambler's ruin. And it he his metaphor is David versus Goliath. Goliath has all the resources um, and can take the punches and the losses, uh, but David has more skill. And if the skill advantage is 55, 45 in terms of for for David. It's not wise for David to make large bets. It's very wise for David to make small bets and let that numerical advantage play out over time. Because you can flip a coin and it's 50-50, but it's not out of the realm of possibility that you flip heads or tails five times in a row. It's not that crazy of a long shot uh, or four times in a row. So in and betting with your risk management in your account, if you're going to bet big, 
you can't suffer a lot of big blows in a row. But if you have a statistical edge, if you kind of grow slowly and let that statistical edge play out over time, um, the odds really, really, really go into your favor. So it's a slow way to win the battle. But your chances of winning are really good. David could be Goliath with big bets, but the big bets now favor Goliath because he can lose more than David can lose. So when you're up against Ken Griffin at Citadel in the market, that's got the biggest bankroll of all time and your bankroll is little, um, can consider that when you're thinking about compounding so fast and putting a lot on the line. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, topic, gambler's ruin. And one of the takeaways, if I can just get your confirmation, one of the the, the big takeaways is for a trader to find their edge, have edge, and find a way to maintain that edge over time, meaning show up to the market the next day and the next day, maintain their capital so that they don't run out by, by taking too big of bets in a short amount of time because they could blow up their account conceivably in a couple of days or say a week versus having edge, trading small, staying in the game for months, years, and being able to compound more or less that way. Absolutely. A Anthony, if you want to get into the position that I am, that you've been day trading for, you know, 20 years and you've had a good journey. It's, you know, this has been fun. There's been stress along the way, but, you know, if you're going to be in the top 1% of income earners in America, those people for the most part are, you know, are in stressful jobs too, but you need to make it as least stressful as possible. And if the goal is to be a successful day trader, it's fun solving the puzzle. I enjoy coming to, you know, to work every day and doing it. So like slow and steady, you know, wins the race for me. It's, you know, I'm not going to be number one in the Hall of Fame, you know, for, you know, for traders, but that's, you know, that's not my, you know, my, my goal. You want to develop your edge. You want to execute it. You want to stay on your toes, have consistency and make the job, you know, as least stressful as possible and, and fun and, you know, take the money, pay your taxes and go enjoy uh, your life and do all those, you know, all those great things that are, are out there. One of my questions is how can other traders out there build themselves a trading system? You know, what are some things that you would recommend for traders um, to help build themselves a system and what benefits would a trading system provide for the trader who doesn't currently have one? If you don't currently have one, you need you need to stop trading right now. The, the, that's that that's for sure. You're not going to randomly go into the market and be your bankroll against Ken Griffin's bankroll at Citadel um, and beat him. You're not going to beat me. You're going to win some hands, but you're not going to beat me. You're not going to beat great traders. You're not going to beat. Jim Simons over at Renaissance, who's got the great mathematicians, you know, in the world, you're not going to beat these superior players with superior resources. You, the first thing, like, I have, I've been doing this a long time. So I have advice for new traders. I have advice for people that make money consistently. And I have advice for probably an, an area that I have no expertise, people way above me. So, My advice to a new trader is if you don't have a trading system, stop trading. So like things, things that I do, like here's your homework project if you're a new trader. And, and, and I'm dead serious. I'm a I'm a seasons trade, I'm a seasoned trader. And these are notes, handwritten notes and notes and notes and notes. And then this is my speech from Traders for a Cause. I mean, it took me hours and hours and hours to write that stuff. These are these are my yellow pad notes that when I see something on Twitter that makes sense, I write down. 
if you're a new trader, here is your homework assignment. If you want to get like good in this business, take some time away from the screen and do yourself a homework project. Go to Twitter, follow the 10 best traders um, that you think are are really good. And you, you, you better know who's good and who who's not good. But you need to write, you need to to do research. Like you if, if you really want to learn something, but they say the best way to learn it is to teach it. So if you want to learn about a trading system, you need to Google trading system, go to Yahoo, go to Twitter, and see all the different types of trading systems. Then you need to do a research report on execution. How do I execute better? Then you need to do a research report on risk management. Okay, so IBD says lose 8%, uh, sh small cap short seller up here. So, and then do a research report on consistency. So each one of those research reports should take you like maybe five to 10 hours if you do a thorough job and write all this stuff down and then write a presentation like you're gonna be giving a speech to a class. You will learn so much from writing it down and it's gonna stay in your head. Like if you just watch this video and you take no action, zero benefit to you. You just entertain yourself for a little bit. You need to, to actually write this stuff down and study it. I, I was watching this interview the other day with this uh, with this kid, uh, Jason. He's a small cap short seller. He's like 25 years old. Um, he's a very impressive guy. He's only been trading four years. He seemed very, very smart. And then I started following him on Twitter. And he posted this tweet. And he's like, oh, this is a summary of uh, the guy, uh, the the. The Twitter guy is uh, all day faders. Very, 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 very good trader from what I've seen. He's like, oh, I went back and read every single tweet that he's ever done. And I made a summary of all these bullet points. And I've seen people do that for Christian Qualamaghi. I've seen people do that, uh, summarize other great traders. Uh, you know, Shadkin back in the day had some great, you know, great information out there. Um, Ospex Research, who kind of, opened a lot of people's eyes 10 years ago. You go back and you 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 read all this stuff. So this guy, he's like, yeah, he's like, I summarized all this. And this is part of the 109 pages that I've written um, since I've been trading. So here's a guy who's written like 109 pages. And and if if you're new in this business, yeah, you need screen time and so forth, but you need to develop a system. You need to learn how to execute it. You need to have proper risk management and all those things are gonna to lead to consistency. So spend some time away from the screen doing these homework projects and write this stuff down, be able to teach it and, and have it on the top of your head you know, all the time because when you do this stuff and you do it religiously, it becomes habit. And then you read your notes all the time. And when you read your notes, you stay on your toes and every day, like you're prepared for the stock market, you let your guard down and bam, right? I mean, that's what happens in this business. Um, to the intermediate trader who's a profitable trader, uh, the best advice to you and to the people above me is cut your trades in half by cut, cut whatever your volume, is, not your volume, number of trades, cut your trades in half or at least by a third. So if you're doing 10 trades a day, try to go down to five or go down to seven or go down to four and eliminate the B setups and just trade the A setups. And then in those A setups, double your size or triple your size. So you'll trade less frequently, um, but you'll have less stress and you're probably gonna make a lot more money. You know, most of the people that I talk to, I, I don't think anyone ever says, well, gee, if I just traded a lot more, I'd be doing better. No, it's it's really the other way around. You need to sit around and um, uh, not don't just do something, sit there. The opposite of don't just sit there, do something is really how it works. And to the guys that are way more successful than me, um, you know, just have balance in your life. Uh, you know, make sure you work out, hit the gym, all basic stuff. Um travel, go on trips, spend a lot of time with your family, you know, coach some sports. Uh, to the people that make more money than me, there's a saying, some people have no idea how to make money and some people don't know when to stop making money. And 
when you're really successful at this, monetary goals are all wonderful, but balance in life, like when you look back at your life and it's just a dollar sign, it's going to be pretty hollow. So, you know, get away from the desk and do those things. Don't sit here till six, seven, eight o'clock at night all the time. Once in a while, I get it, but you know, it, it, it ain't worth it. I mean, the reason you make the money is so you can live the life that you want to live and not be, uh, um, you know, a slave to the screen. So if you are fortunate enough to make it in this business, take it from someone who's been sitting in the chair a long time, you know, don't, you know, coach your kids sports, take your mom out to dinner, you know, be generous, karma, be a good guy. That's tremendous advice, Scott. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I think it's really important that you really emphasize the importance of implementing change, doing the work, not just listening to interviews or, or talks and sort of forgetting what has been said, but really taking the time to implement research and make changes to our own trading to the point that maybe for a beginning trader, that means stop trading for a little bit and really figure out what their trading system is. So I think that's that's great advice. And I, I know you alluded to um, your Traders for a Cause speech. And so if it's OK with you, I'd love to ask a few questions about that speech. I know it was on consistency, uh, but it was an audience favorite. It was one of my favorites from that weekend. So I'd love to, to ask some questions if that's OK. I'd love to do that. I spent a lot of time on that speech. I'm ha happy to uh, to talk about it. Great. So. One of the metaphors that you used was about whether or not to bring your offense or your defense out onto the field for that particular trading day based on whether or not you're seeing a four-star setup or a five-star setup. Can you maybe talk about that and how that might fit into somebody's trading system? Sure. Um, I, of all the things that I talked about that day, I, I, I do feel that that's probably like one of the most important topics. and. Like when you when you have a trading system, you you need to be able to you know stick with it and execute it. And these analogies and metaphors that I talked about are things that are easier to remember than just okay stick with your trading system. It just it just helps you. So offense and defense is 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 huge in this business. You know, offense sells the tickets, defense wins the ball games. Your job is to extract money from the stock market and to keep it. And to keep it, um, people find that a very difficult thing to do. Everybody can put up winners, um, but you know, avoiding losers, knowing when to trade, when not to trade, um, that's a, a huge thing. And especially uh, if you traded in 2020 and 2021, I bet you 2022, for the most part, 90% of your listeners uh, was not nearly as kind uh, because you use the same recipe. Um, that used in 2021 and 2022, and you probably had much worse results. So offense and defense. Um, my scanner lights up in the morning. Uh, I take the temperature of the market. Is my five-minute scanner box going crazy? Uh, and there's a lot of activity and animal spirits are really, really high? Or is the five-minute box kind of quiet News is kind of quiet, economic, uh, not a lot of economic numbers out. Um, it's a slow, it's looking slow. So when I'm looking at that scanner box in the morning, and let's say I've had a multi-day runner and today's day three of a gap up for a really hot stock and it's in the box, um, or conversely, it's a uh, we've had two bad days in the market and it's a gap down. Um my five star setup after something's gone up like three days or or gone down for three days is present and I see it and I am going to attack that trade on the open. Um, and I want to hit that with full force. That's my five star setup. I like that setup and I'm going to attack it. If I don't see my five star setup, I'm going to send my defense on the field. I don't have. I see things that look like C setups and B setups, and I'm going to wait and see if those C setups and B setups develop into A setups. And if they don't, I'm not going to trade them because I've set certain standards for myself, and I'm not going to I'm not going to lower my standards 
um, on a consistent basis because that's creating bad habits. I really only want to focus on the A setup. So when I come in, the trade should be staring me in the face that I'm going to do. If I can't find the trade, I'm sitting back in my chair and I'm letting the trade find me. I'm going to sit here and I'm going to do nothing but observe. The market is going to show its hand and reveal more information throughout the day. Maybe there's enough information for me to get interested and there's bids and offers to place and hopefully I get hit on my bids or taken on my offers. Um, but offense and defense, taking the temperature of the market, subtle changes happen all the time and those subtle changes start out slow and then they turn out turned into like really, really big things. Like when the market topped in March of when Bill Wang blew up in March of 2021, um, the whole character of the market changed and I could I could see it in my boxes. Um, some of that's through experiences, but I had to realize that I need to start adjusting the way I trade. So you can't come into the market every day and say, I wanna make money and say, I'm gonna you know, send my offense out to the field and I'm gonna force something that's not there. You want to be consistent. You want to make money. You need to trade your A plus setups. And if they're not there, you better, you know, better sit still. Thank you. I think that's really important, especially in 2023, where we're starting to see maybe a little bit of a change based on what we saw in 2022. It's only been about, you know, 10 trading days so far, but I think it's an important uh, thing for traders to think about. Yeah, just to expand on that a little bit, it's uh, January 14th. We just finished the second trading week of the year and animal spirits are are back. I, I send a short request to my broker every morning with a with with a list of stocks looking to get some borrows that I don't have to pay for. And every day I add to this list and then the list becomes so friggin long that every couple of months I have to uh delete it and what i do is i sit in front of my computer i pull up the chart and it's like what's the chance i'm going to be trading this and i i delete it and or i i slim the list down so i did this like just last week and i had just like 200 stocks on there and so many of the stocks that were seven eight ten twelve fifteen twenty dollars are now down to the buck 50 cents 10 cents i mean some of them are just known perma scams but there's so many blown up charts that I think there's going to be activity here in the in the part of the of the new year. Uh, what the what the large cap market does, you know, I, I have I have my ideas, but I don't I don't trade my ideas. I just trade setups. Setups are something that is a pattern that I recognize, and um, I trade them. I don't I don't really trade my my macro opinions about the market. They're consistently um, wrong and uh that's not trading a system i trade a system uh so yeah activities uh um definitely uh picked up um there was a lot of money to be made and a lot of money to be lost in the first two weeks depending on if you which side of it uh you were on absolutely and one of the other topics that you uh spoke about was about the importance of taking losses, particularly small losses. Can you talk a little bit about the importance uh, of taking those small losses for you and your trading system? Uh, sure. In my, in, in my speech in uh, Traders for a Cause, I, I referred to a, a speech that Phil Godeker, um had given a couple of years before, and uh, I call it the paper cut speech. And Phil gave the speech. Uh, Phil's, for those of you that don't know, him um, go watch every single thing that he's ever put out on YouTube uh, at Traders for a Cause. Uh, and let's just uh, give Traders for a Cause and Project Impact a quick moment here. I've been at Traders for a Cause, I think six or seven years. The years, the one or two years I couldn't go, I, I paid for it and I watched it and I watched the videos. There's so much valuable information on there. Um, if you want to watch my speech this year or Brian Lee's speech or all these other great speeches and all the years pack, uh, past, sign up for Project Impact. I think it's like 300 bucks it's for the year. It's a ton of content, um, really good stuff. And you can see Phil's paper cut speech. So there's the Traders for a Cause Project Impact. Uh, uh, I, I love 
love being involved in that. And I encourage everyone to get involved. The relationships that you make there are just uh, priceless and it's a great time. Um, everybody gets something out of it. Uh, I got to meet you, Anthony. Yeah. Right. Yep. Abs uh, absolutely. So small losses, uh, paper cuts. So Phil gave the speech and he's like, I get in something. If I'm not right, right away, I take a paper cut. And I, if I, then I try it again. If I'm not right, I take a paper cut, a paper cut, a paper cut. And I kept saying to myself, like, this really, really, really makes a lot of sense. And I called it the paper cut speech. And that's what I think about. So in my speech at Traders for a Cause, I said, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut. And I think I said it like 10 times in a row. As, as dumb as this sounds, every morning when you sit at your desk before the market opens, if you say to yourself, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, cut your losses small, cut your losses small. If you say that, it'll be in the forefront of your mind every day. Just like you take a vitamin or just, you know, whatever part of your morning routine it is, we're all going to lose in this business. And uh, if you take the big losses or you don't have a good trading system, you're eventually going to be out of the business. Uh, but if you take a ton of paper cuts, you ain't going to die. If you lose a limb, you're going to die. Um, the paper cut speech. Say to yourself every morning, say it five times, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, paper cut, it works. Thanks, Scott. And I just want to underscore the importance of Traders for a Cause and the philanthropic goals that they set. Also, for those who are interested in watching Phil Godeker's Traders for a Cause speech and other content, you can go to impact.tradersforacause.org and find lots of content that will be helpful for your trading. Scott, one of the other um, metaphors that you used was about horse racing. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how horse racing has an impact and is applicable for trading. Uh, yeah, so I was, you know, trying to think of all these different metaphors and analogies because, like, these are the things that stick in your mind um, versus just statistics. And when I was thinking about what are some of the great ones to use, like horses came to my mind because it really deals with like the crowds and distractions. Like when you go to a horse track, the, the horse has a covering on its face and it's called blinders or blinkers. Or even when you go on a horse-drawn carriage ride and you're on vacation, that horse has the covering on it. Why does the horse wear, you know, that covering? And it's the horse has a job to do. And the horse gets distracted by the crowds. When it has that hood on, it keeps it focused and it keeps it staying in the lane. The horse is going to run its best race when it's not being distracted by the crowd. The horse is going to pull the carriage and not go chase a raccoon or a squirrel or, or, or something else. It has less chance of getting distracted, which is very important because you're in the back of the carriage, um, and, and doing something crazy. So... Horses, in order to run your best race, you, you can have distractions. Like I, I have my office, it's my nest, I'm comfortable here. I have my chair that I love, my monitors that I like, my keyboard, uh, the right sounds, the right lighting and and so forth. You, you don't want distractions. And, and this is a good time to bring up uh, chat rooms. So good trading is staying focused on staying in your lane, know what you're good at and do it. When uh, I'm a member of Investors Underground, I've been in there for, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years. Absolutely love it. It's pro uh, my opinion, it's the best on the street. The technology tools um, that they keep adding are, are unbelievable. And there's a lot of great traders in there to form relationships on. And it's the fastest news service on the on the street and so forth. So those are all the, the good things, right? But what are the bad things? The bad things are the good trading is like emotionless. And every day in like the, the trading room, someone's like, you know, sick, awesome, unbelievable, um, things that like generate emotion, FOMO, fear of missing out. Oh, I got to do the next trade that this guy does. Um, you see things you know, in there that are counterproductive to you staying focused. 
So you have to under you have to know how to use a chat room, you know, to your benefit. Um, that's like very, very important. Like any if a chat room creates emotion or FOMO or, you know, you should be pulling the bits and pieces of it out that are helpful, you know, to you. Um, it's not just a, a, about copying, you know, all kinds of all kinds of trades. It's a it's it's a resource, but it's not the end all, you know, be all. So, you know, that's what I think about with horse racing is, is you don't want to be distracted by the crowds. And when you're in a chat room, you can be distracted by the crowds. When you're on Twitter, um, you can be distracted by the crowds. I, you know, I came across something the other day and I was like kind of bummed out about it. This this guy who I, I know and I like a lot, he, he was describing his trade and he was talking about he was short the stock and he realized that he was he was he was wrong so he got long the stock and made his his money back and had a green day and he thought that was good you know i had a green day and i i think that's horrendous like you have a trading system and the system says that i'm going to be short or i'm going to be long and then if if it doesn't work, you're you're wrong. You're accepting the results of the trading system. But to flip your bias because you you lost money, like that's no one has that trading system that's made money. So you did something stupid and you got rewarded for it. And I thought this trader was already past like doing stuff like that. Like when I see stuff like that, it's like mm, you um it might have worked that time, but you're just creating a really bad habit for yourself. And, uh, it, you know, bummed me out to, you know, to, to see that. That's an interesting point that you make about the blinders and some of the benefits that a chat room like Investors Underground can have. Because, yeah, Max does an excellent job with the technology. And yet there's a personal responsibility element for the traders to well implement their system and to not get carried away by what they see to the left or to the right. Uh, very much like horse racing. So... I think that's that's tremendously helpful. And um, one of the other questions that I had for you, Scott, or rather one of the the metaphors that that I thought was uh, really interesting was about poker and some of the advantages that um, traders have compared to maybe a poker player. First off, I think the similarities between poker and trading are uh, they have quite a few similarities. Um, knowing when to bet heavy, knowing when to pull back, knowing the environment, you know, that you're, you're in, am I playing against, you know, a bunch of pros today? Or am I playing against a bunch of kids that are here on spring break, whose parents gave them money and they only have five hours to be here and they're going to be doing some stupid shit. And I'm just going to wait for them to make their mistakes. Um, but the, the one analogy with poker uh, that I use, like when you enter a poker tournament or you sit at a poker table, um, the similarity between that and trading is if you lose all your chips, you're done, right? You lose all your money, you're out of the game. And you don't want to have that. You don't want to have that happen. So in poker, you have, you know, an ante, you have to play this hand, you have to put your money in the pot and you can't always, you're, you're forced to play that hand. Well, in the stock market, that doesn't happen to you. You don't have to put an ante in. You don't have to put money into a trade that isn't an A-plus trade, that isn't, you know, let's say on your on your ante hand, you got a, you know, a, a, a five, six. Well, it's like, okay, I'm, you know, I want to see the flaw. But in the in the stock market, you don't have to play that hand. Could it win? Yeah. But you don't you don't have to play that hand. So I think it's really important that you recognize you have an advantage, that the advantage is to be able to sit there and do nothing and hold on to all your capital until you see somebody making a mistake or you feel that you have a big advantage. And that's like one of the things that people, I, I think, really make a big mistake with in trading is they think that they're at the poker table they have to play I, I i mean i sit at my desk you know sometimes from six in the morning till four in the afternoon and i place 
a bunch of orders, nothing gets taken. And I go home and I did no trades, but I executed what my strategy is. I kept my standards. This is my discipline. This is what brings me to the promised land. And, you know, you look on Twitter and some guy posted a, a huge winner and something and so forth. Um, there's a term unfuckwithable by Joseph Burns. And it's like you're at a peaceful place in life. Um, and just nobody, I know what I'm good at. Nobody can mess with me. I don't have envy. Um, I, you know, make good decisions. Uh, I'm, I, I've set standards for myself. Um, I'm happy to see people do well. Um, I'm thrilled that all the young kids are coming into the business and, and doing well. There's so much to learn from these young kids. Um, I, when I see them make a mistake, I want to say something. Uh, but you know we're all going to learn the same uh, the same lessons eventually. The market the market gods are going to you know going to teach you your lesson whether it's now or in six months or six years. It's you know the market's going to humble you. Yeah. Thanks. I think that's a really important point to drive home, which is we don't have to take a trade. It's okay to sit on our hands, watch something, and like you had mentioned previously, when a setup comes to you and it's one of your, your playbook trades, something that you're familiar with, then maybe that's the time to take the trade. My superpower in trading is to be able to sit in this chair all day long and not place a trade and, and not feel bad about it. Like my job, I'm playing defense. My I just made a bunch of money and I'm not gonna give it back on some subpar um, trade. Like my job is to put points up on the scoreboard I'm not going to score every time I, you know, I get the ball given to me. But at the end of the week, at the end of the month, at the end of the year, if I stuck to my discipline, um, I'm going to put a lot of points on the scoreboard, and I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to make a lot of money. But, you, but that, you know, you got to be comfortable, you know, uh, you know, in, in your own skin. You got to be honest, you know, with yourself. This is. This is a counterintuitive thing that it takes to be a winner in the stock market. Cut, cutting your losses. Um, it, it's not easy to sit here and do it. Try to sit here. If you've never done it, try to sit in your chair all day and just, you know, observe if there's nothing A plus there. And don't worry about not making money. If you trade less frequently and trade only your A plus setups, you're going to make so much more money. Um, but some people are just addicts. They need to trade all day. You know, I'll take a 5,000, 10,000 share position in something, and the guy sitting across from me will be in, you know, uh, 300 of this and 300 of that and 300 of this, and he's staying busy all day. You you miss you miss the big trades when you, you know, when you do that. Thank you. And that's definitely one of those perspectives that a consistently profitable trader who's been doing this for many years can provide for, for traders out there or to underscore for some of the traders who've been trading for a while that maybe just need to hear it again. And you mentioned one of the biggest losses, if not the biggest loss that you had in your trading career uh, back in 2018 with the VIX and the VIX apocalypse. Can you talk a little bit about the impact that had on you and how you bounced back from that? Uh, sure. And um, while while we're on that uh, subject, we can talk a, a little bit about um, big uh, losses um, and 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 how they happen. So in uh, in 2018, I I I I don't like I uh, mentioned in the interview. I don't trade after hours. Um, the Monday after the Super Bowl. Uh, the VIX apocalypse happened. The, the VIX exploded that day, intraday. Uh, I made it was my best trading day in probably um, a couple of years. Uh, had like a six figure day that day. Um, hadn't had one in a while. And I decided uh, that the VIX was really high. And uh, I decided to stick around after hours to see what was going to happen. And one of the instruments uh, that you can express uh, either you can short an instrument or go long an instrument to express a trade in the in the VIX. And one of the instruments seemed to be mispriced after hours. Uh, I got involved in it. 
Um, I bought 10,000 shares at 60. Uh, and when I walked out of here at eight o'clock at night, when trading had stopped, I had, it was at six, I had sold it at 20, I had lost over $400,000. Um, and it was by far the largest loss that I ever had um, taken in my career. Um, so let's talk about like losing and and drawdowns and so forth. When, when you suffer a massive loss, there's like three things that could lead to it. One is if you have a, a trading system and your trading system's no good and you lost a bunch of money in a row and you're in a big drawdown. Number two is you have no rules in place for anything, um, for a max loss, for a loss on a trade, for what percentage of your brokerage account you're willing to lose. You're just flying by the seat of your pants. You have no rules. Number three is you have rules and you broke them. So in my instance, it was number three. I don't trade after hours. And I am trading a leveraged instrument that's got a 100-page prospectus that some of the most sophisticated traders I know had no idea that this thing revalues at NAV at 430 um, on that day. And the new NAV was like six. And by the time you figured it out, uh, it was the stock, the losses were already just so massive. And a lot of smart people lost money in that trade. So I broke a rule. So I'm a very consistent trader. I have a set of rules. Um, I do very good over time. So how is it for me to come back from that? Probably not that bad. Um, it took me eight months and 13 days. It was the biggest drawdown in my career. Um, I still made over 200 grand that year, um, which I was very proud of. But it was probably the greatest accomplishment of my trading career because it could have broke me. and if you use a lot of leverage or have an over put too much of your account into one stock, that would have taken you out of the game. So um, I see a lot of young guys here uh, use crazy leverage. They want to get rich so fast as opposed to steady Eddie. And uh, that would have been an example. You know, my broker said there was, you know, two guys along with myself that, you know, have been trading for 10 plus years uh, whose accounts got incinerated, gone. They just got liquidated. So if you're going to use leverage, you know, be careful. Um, number two, if you have no rules, you better start making rules because you ain't going to fly by the seat of your pants and get away with it. And number three, if you are going into a large drawdown because your system um, isn't performing well, you really, really, really have to cut down on your size. Now, if you don't have a great trading system and you don't have rules, I don't really think you can bounce back from something like that. Mentally, it just might cripple you. Um, you might, if you lost too much of your account, now you don't have the capital to make it back efficiently. It could take a much, much, much longer time. But in my particular instance, I broke a rule and the trading gods, you know, gave me the punishment and it was friggin' severe, no doubt about it. But competence, before confidence. And I'm very competent at what I do. So I have confidence to come in and make it back. If you don't have consistency through a good trading system, through a good set of rules, you're not going to make it back. So are you going to wait for it to happen? Or are you going to be proactive and put some rules in place and develop the things that we talk about? Thank you so much, Scott, for being open about that particular trade. I know it's not something that anybody necessarily wants to talk about, but I think there's a lot of benefits for traders out there who are listening. And also it shows the importance, which you spoke about, of having a trading system and sticking to your rules and being consistent. I'm happy to hear that you bounced back and had a great year that, that year. It wasn't a great year, but it, it but it, it was the most meaningful um, year of my life trading what I learned. I mean, in 2020 and 2021, I made, you know, really, really 
really good money. Um, and that was well and good, but I practiced for that through all the tough years and I got to reap the fruits of, you know, my labor of the tough times during the good times. I was, I was ready for it. So those years were, were great, but bouncing back, you know, again, adversity is your opportunity to prove yourself. And, um, that was a great accomplishment, uh, for me. And it wasn't instant. It, you know, it took eight months. I put myself in the doghouse for a long time and, and rightfully so. I mean, you're going to break rules. Um, the punishment can be pretty severe. And one of the things you also mentioned, I believe, in your Trainers for a Cost speech was a quote from Mark Douglas, which is, the consistency that you seek is in your mind, not in the markets. And I was wondering if you can expand on that a little bit and let us know what does that quote mean to you? So for my style of trading, like... Uh... I'm an intraday trader and I'm just as happy to go long as I am to go short. I prefer to be short, but um, I like going long too when things are diving down. If divergence is there, I'm you know probably getting involved. Um, so I can uh, I, I just like volatility. So if the market's going uh, you know really volatile, it's it's great for me. But if it's steady eddy, it's fewer pitches to to swing at. But I still have a a trade I still have a trading system. I am not relying on the market to see if I can um I need the mark I don't need the market to cooperate with me to make money. It's just a matter of how much money I'm going to make. If the market's cooperating with my type of system, um with my volatility, my expertise, I'm probably going to make a lot of money. I'm going to lose too. Um that's all part of it. But my 20-year history says during the volatile times, you're going to make more. During the slower times, I'm going to make less. But the consistency that I'm producing isn't because I need the market to cooperate with me. There's I, I've seen guys on Twitter for the last two years who are like, like uh, psychiatrists and like oh stay out of the market if it's if it's you know if it if it's not your style um you can adapt if you learned one style you can learn another style you can add something to your playbook if you've never mastered one thing or got good at one thing or became profitable at one thing then you don't want to spread yourself too thin and you know be a jack of all trades and master of none because uh, that's not going to get you anywhere in the market. You got to be a specialist. But consistency comes from repeating, repeating, repeating process over and over again. It's just not to me, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of how much. So don't fill your head with, you know, I can't do this. I got to wait for things to get better. You, it's a good time to be practicing your craft with just, you know, smaller amounts of money and trying, you know, trying new things. So if you're the guy that needs the market to cooperate with him 100% of the time, uh, you, you, better, you better make a lot, a lot of money when it's really good, and you better save a lot of it. Because if we go through a dry period of a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, we could have a decade of no returns. It's not out of the, it's not out of the question. Go ask you know, Japan. It's, it, it, it could happen. I mean, we have to unwind this whole QE, zero interest rate things. No one knows the answer. We haven't, haven't been here before. It could be, you know, slow for a while with pockets of, of heating up. So consistency isn't about the market cooperating. It's about um, your habits. One of the, the questions I have sort of on this topic, you know, retrospectively, looking back, you've been trading for over 20 years now, Scott. And so what, if anything, um, would you say is maybe something you would have done differently or dare I even say the word regret that you might have uh, in trading? Uh, well, thanks for asking that. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I like to consider myself like, you know, authentic. Um, I wear it on my sleeve. Uh, I got no reason to lie or hide or 
or anything like that. So I, I, I will just answer that honestly. And fortunately, my um, my uh, my answer isn't one that bothers me too much, but it it is one that I I think about from time to time. I mean, the worst thing would be like, oh, if you didn't spend kids with your family or you wrecked your marriage um, uh, or you let your health get really bad. My my biggest regret is I have been. If there was like a, a trading hall of fame for like day traders, I probably would could get into the trading hall of fame, but I wouldn't be in the upper, upper echelon of the trading hall of fame. You know, guys that have taken 50,000 to 5 million and then 5 million to 50 million and then to 100 million. I have been successful at this every year that I have done this. I've I've never made under six figures in all of my my 20 years doing this. But the one thing that I never did is I never. I had people offer me outside capital. I didn't want to take it because I didn't want to boss. I didn't want to answer to anybody. Um, I never pushed myself and truly tried to compound my account and get really, really wealthy. And I wonder if I had done that um, instead of being conservatively growing my account, how good or how big I could be. Um, and And that sometimes you know, is on the back of my mind um, that I just never push the the pedal to the metal. And if you're new in this business and you don't have consistency, it's outrageous to even think of doing that. You should be protecting your capital under all circumstances. But once you're like a consistently proven trader, um, I never scaled up to the level I, I don't use a fraction of the money that I have in my account to trade on an intraday basis unless something is super, super juicy. Um, I rarely, rarely ever even go on margin. Um, so I, I just never pushed myself to the limits. I'm sure if I was at a trading firm, they would have encouraged me to do that. But I always have, once I made it and got comfortable, you get to, you know, 100,000 in the bank, uh, you know, uh, 500,000, a million dollars, you have a seven figure trading account. Once you do that, like you don't want to you don't want to run the risk of ruin. And I just always was conservative enough that I don't want to go back to being poor, uh, poor, like when I grew up, figuratively speaking, um, I, I didn't want to risk what I had made. And if I made a lot more money. I'm not sure I would have been any happier because I, all the money problems I have in life, I can solve with what I have. But I, I, um, I, I never really pushed myself, uh, you know, to that level. So if that's my biggest regret, uh, you know, I can, I can live with that. Well, thank you for answering that and answering it honestly. And I appreciate that you prefaced it by saying you're doing fine now. You know, you're you're not struggling, but it's just one of those intangibles that sometimes we just could never answer because you can't turn back time. And and so it's it's always kind of an interesting thing uh, to think about. So thank you. I could start now pushing it, but that wouldn't be so wise at, at my age. Absolutely. It, it seems like you're doing fine now. And um, yeah, if it's okay with you, Scott, I would love to be able to go through sort of a lightning round set of questions if that's okay with you. Uh, sure. Great. My first question is, what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given from another trader? Stay on your toes. You can't let your guard down. Um, stay humble. Uh, don't think that you're the greatest. The market, market is going to humble you. Um, and... And lastly, I would say it's it's keep an open mind. The, the the market is forever changing. You don't have all the answers. Someone's always doing it better than you. Uh, you you're never too old to learn, to change things. Um, I, I would say those three things. And do you tend to learn more from a big loss or a big win? Definitely more from the loss, but but they're both 
you know, super, super important. You know, the my all of my, my big wins, like those stories aren't like to me that great. My big losses are the the scars that I I wear on my soul and brain and you know keep me out of trouble going forward. Um all successful, you know, traders have the it's a rite of passage, you know, almost it's it's almost impossible to to be really successful and not have suffered some, you know, major um setbacks in trading. But that those are the ones that you really learn from. So um pain provides wisdom. Uh and if it's hard to have wisdom and uh without experiencing pain. So I would say the losses. And is there one area of your trading where you'd like to improve? Yeah, I said this at uh, Traders for a Cause. My risk management, for the most part, just sucks. It, it's not that great. It's amazing how successful um, I've been at trading and how good my consistency is. But um, I have an issue. Uh, to this day, I still don't have a max loss. Um, you know, I don't. I I don't use leverage. Uh, so when I do get caught in the VIX apocalypses of the world years ago, um, very, very, very painful. But um, adversity is your opportunity to prove yourself. And every time I make a mistake, I uh, I want to prove to myself that I can, you know, that I can get better. Um, but my risk management needs to. Uh, improve and it's a work in progress still 20 20 years later i recently um called brian lee and brian was nice enough to talk to me for like an hour and a half um and he gave me some suggestions about things to think about um my son works at a prop firm and i talked to the risk manager there um i'm a, I'm a very successful trader and here i am going to people asking for advice um in my areas of weakness and it just goes back to like you know, being humble, but my risk management needs to improve. Um, you don't want to say stat. You don't want to say like um, static in uh, in this business. You always want to be evolving. And my last question, Scott, is for those listening who would like to learn more about you, your trading system, or would like to get a hold of you. What's the best way for them to do so? Um. Well, I'm on Twitter, but I don't interact on Twitter. Um, if I see something I like, uh, I might make a comment, but I don't start conversations because uh, um, Twitter, I just, if, if I'm going to get involved in something, I'm going to give it my all. Um, that's just kind of who I am. And I don't like uh, a lot of the stuff that I see on Twitter, but it's probably one of my most valuable resources. Um I, I just don't want to get, I don't want to wrestle with the pig and get dirty. Uh, I'm, that's not, it's beneath my standards uh, that I've set for myself, you know, no upside, a lot of downside. Um, so on Twitter, if you reach out to me, um, if it's something exceptional, I might respond. Uh, or I will also make a promise here. If you're that new trader or existing trader and you do that homework assignment and you write some five page papers and on on execution and consistency um, and you show me you've done the work or or you've done somebody's you had their Twitter feed and you still have questions and you want, you know, a little coaching or a little advice. If someone put in 10, 20, 30 hours of work before they ask, you know, a question, because um, to be a great trader. You got to solve puzzles and you got to be a problem solver because we're all going to have problems and we got to figure out how to overcome them and so forth. If if you take the time to do all that stuff that I that will change your trading career or at least vastly improve the chances of your trading career, um, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, an email exchange or or something like that. Um, I did an interview uh, last year with Alex B. The Story. Uh, Alex, a great guy, and it was the first interview I ever did. Um, my way of kind of giving back. It's on YouTube. Um, it's pretty pretty well received. A lot of the same things we talked about today, but it mixes it up a little bit more. Uh, I tell you to watch that video. Um, 
go to Traders for a Cause because I'll be there every year and come up to me and say hello. Um, and if we, you know, bond, maybe we'll, you know, communicate. Um, but if you put some work in and then you reach out to me, um, you might get a, you know, a little bit of a, a response. And it's not because I, I don't care. I just don't have time to to do it. I, I'll give back in the masses with some advice via video is my effective way of doing it. Great. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for being here and taking the time to speak with me today. I think a lot of what you discussed today will be tremendously helpful for a lot of people out there. So thank you. Hat tip to you for what you do and uh, uh, may be happy, healthy and wealthy for your whole life. If you liked this video, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe and notification bell. Thanks for watching.